This is the web transcription service of the Royal Canadian Military Institute. On January 21, 2015, the first Military History Night of our 2015 Spring Session was addressed by retired Captain of Canadian Parachute Troops Jim Stanton, whose father, Captain Austin Stanton, was with the King's Own Calgary Tank Regiment at the disastrous Dieppe Raid of August 19, 1942. Captain Stanton described the battle through his father's eyes. Thanks very much. It's a real pleasure to be here. Uh, I have some uh, good friends that have attended as well. Al Thomas from uh, former Toronto Fire Royal Regiment of Canada uh, here, and my good friend Kim Galway, who's uh, coincidentally uh, a longtime friend and colleague, and she's videotaping my presentation tonight. So uh, thanks for being here. You're going to see some interesting material, stuff that you've never seen before. You'll see some pictures you're familiar with, but you'll see some things you've not seen because my father uh, maintained uh, a diary. Uh, his time from when he left Canada to went to England to train and then when he was taken prisoner of war and afterwards. And my mother kept all his letters that he wrote as a prisoner of war from uh, 1942 till he, he was liberated in 1945. And uh, you're going to see some images in there. You're also going to see something uh, quite distinct, but I'll save that as a little teaser for you because it, uh, it's a little gift for you. Uh, <clears throat> August the 19th, 1942, is uh, described by some who uh, have studied the Battle of Dieppe, uh, Canada's Day of Infamy. infamy. Uh, it was a day in which more than 900 Canadians died, uh, about 2,000 were killed, wounded, or captured uh, in a single day. Their battle lasted roughly eight hours. And in that time, uh, the Canadian Army got its first bloody nose in World War II. To understand DF, you need to understand what the situation was in England. And I know that in this room there will be many people who are eminently qualified as military historians. And, and so for you, this is a refresher. For some of you, though, it may be uh, new information, or at least information from a different perspective. But by 1942, we'd had a very significant standing army in England for about two and a half years. It was an all-volunteer army, and the Canadian Army prided themselves on the fact that we were only volunteers, and that we went there to fight the Germans. My, my mother was an American, and uh, she could not understand why my father, who had a child, me, uh, would go off and fight England's war. She said, well, you're exempt, you don't have to go. You know, the, the married men with children don't have to go fight. And he said, no, you don't understand. He said, we have to stop them. They're evil. Pretty simple. And they believe that. Now, in today's uh, 21st century, you know, we question those values. So let me tell you, that was the value of those men and women who served overseas in World War II. So we got a, we got a couple of hundred thousand troops in England. They're itching to get into battle. They're not getting into battle. Remember what Europe looked like in 1942. Uh, the blue and orange is all... Uh, Nazi-occupied or Nazi collaborators. Uh, the, the Slovaks, the Hungarians, the Romanians, the Bulgarians, the Croatians. Remember, they all chose to fight on the Nazi side. And France, uh, in its duplicitous way, uh, became a Vichy government, a traitorous government, and uh, folded up and turned over all the, anything that the Germans wanted in terms of uh, undesirables, uh, Jews, homosexuals, Catholics, uh, infirm, to the Nazis for the grist mills of their concentration camp. Europe was effectively occupied by the Nazis, and England was standing alone. Operation Barbarossa, any people, how many people are familiar with Barbarossa? See your hands? Yeah, okay, good. Uh, massive penetration uh, by the German army uh, moving. They thought they had secured the Western Front. They now uh, move east into uh, Germany, uh, from Germany into uh, what was then the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics, the Soviet Union, and Stalin was putting huge pressure on the Allies, Churchill and, and Roosevelt in particular, to ease the pressure on the Russians. He said, the Russians, we're, we're fighting and dying to, for the Allied cause. And remember, Barbarossa, this is, this is how far they had advanced. They were to the gates of Stalingrad. To the gates of Stalingrad. If you've ever been there, there's a monument about a kilometer from the city district uh, limits. That's how close they were uh, before they were finally stopped. 
The second division, which my father served with, uh, the blue patch, and they, those divisional patches have been reconstituted now uh, in the Canadian Army. They'd been mobilized in September 1939. They were in England in, by 1940, and they did really well in training exercises, uh, performed exceptionally well, and there was, because there was pressure on Canadians, uh, on the Canadian government, uh, by, by its army and by its citizens to get the army into battle, the, the Canadian government agreed to participate in what was going to be called a raid in force uh, against Europe. There had been lots of small raids, commando raids, and the Loyalists had gone to Spitsbergen and burnt a coal mine. And British commanders had done some uh, pretty serious uh, small boat operations, but only little things. Uh, 15 or 20 soldiers go in, uh, create havoc, uh, blow some stuff up, run away, come back home. What they wanted to do was a major raid in force to to show the Germans that the Allies were getting ready to come back to Europe. This is my dad, uh, as a young lieutenant with the uh, what was called the 14th Canadian Armored Regiment, Calgary Tanks. In this picture, he's a lieutenant. Uh, my dad's an Alberta-born uh, guy. Been a, uh, as a as a youth, he was a cavalryman. Uh, he was in the 19th Alberta Dragoons. I mean, that shows you how the world changed in his lifetime from being cavalry to being armored, going from horse-drawn battle formations to armored formations. And uh, he waited for the 19th Alberta Dragoons to be activated, but it looked like they were not going to get called up. They were going to continue as a reserve unit in Canada. So he went to Calgary and joined the, the Calgary tanks uh, who were activated and went to Europe with them. First tanks they had were Matildas. That's the one on the top left. Uh, they were a, a light tank, uh, fairly fast, but uh, but very much under armored. And what uh, that's what they trained with for uh, the first uh, year or so they were in England. And then they got the Churchills. They were the first armored regiment in, in the Canadian forces to get the Churchill tank. And the Churchill was the heaviest Allied tank in World War II, it weighed 40 tons. This is a significant piece of hardware. And it had excellent armor. And thank God, or I wouldn't have, a, have had a father. I had excellent armor. But it had a very under-weaponized uh, uh, system. It had a, a 40 millimeter, two-pounder main armament. That's what we have on our light armored vehicles today. They have 40 millimeters on them. The, the, uh, the Leopard 2s uh, that we have and the Leopard 3s and 4s are all 105 millimeter or bigger. Um, and they had two uh, Biza machine guns, 7.92. They were very hard to access and they were underpowered. They didn't have a big enough engine for the tonnage that they carried and, and it wasn't easy to service them. And if we've got any Army Corps officers here, you know how important tank maintenance is, particularly preventive maintenance. Every time you pull into a logger, they got to maintain the, the tanks. You got to make sure the tracks are okay, that all the all the uh, systems are go. Uh, here's a couple of pictures of uh, of Sherman's um, uh, correction of Churchill's uh, on training exercises in England, uh, World War II. Hard to find color pictures, uh, but I didn't manage to track down a couple. Uh, gave a, gives a good example when you see the troopers as to the size of the, the tank, but you can also see how small the main gun is. Very ineffective. This is my uh, dad's regiment, the Calgary's, uh, doing a, a maintenance on the vehicles at Salisbury Plain in the spring of 1942. They've got the diesel machine guns out and uh, they're cleaning them up and uh, this, uh, this guy standing there is my dad. Um, and and he, he said in his uh, letters home to mom uh, how difficult the maintenance was. But he said, you know, the majority of my troopers our, our former uh, truck drivers, farmers, ranchers, and they're really used to making things work. So they knew how to, how to improvise, and, uh, and they could, they could uh, come up with ways of making cumbersome equipment, uh, maintain it so that it was serviceable. And they did a great job, because the, uh, this is a, a great picture of the 2nd Division at Salisbury Plain with uh, 60 plus tanks on parade, um, and their, um, their ratio of, of uh, maintenance was the highest in the Canadian, uh, amongst the three divisions that were in England at the time, 
So 14 uh, armored car or cavalry tanks was chosen to be part of the second divs a landing force that would go into Dieppe. Um, I want to show you um, a, an interesting uh, video. This is uh, one of the first times I've, been, I've shown it. Um, these are, I, I think they're probably uh, outtakes from, uh, and there's no sound, so it doesn't matter that I talk. I think they're outtakes from um, from a Canadian Army uh, film. This is the, the Calgary's uh, <coughs> in Salisbury Plain. Uh, great pictures of the tanks uh, moving around, uh, coming off uh, the parade, uh, moving towards a, a logger. You'll see it in a minute. There's the general in charge of, uh, of the second uh, division. I'll talk more about him later, uh, taking the salute as, uh, as the tanks uh, go off. Gives a great shot of the the tanks themselves, the equipment, and you'll notice as the, we get some other close-ups, you'll see some of the tanks are waterproof. They have a container on the side so when they went off the landing craft, they could float, right? They didn't have, uh, they wouldn't sink in the, in the, uh, the chop itself. Right? Remember, uh, probably nobody's seen this at least since 1942, so you're getting a preview. Uh, they, they show the tanks are going into a logger. A logger is a an area where they uh, camouflage the vehicles, uh, mount up. Now, these are pictures of the, the uh, infantry and the uh, uh, engineers. Probably every one of those men you see in, in those engineer vehicles was killed at the end because they were all, the engineers were wiped out to a person. You'll see the, uh, you'll see the, uh, the device on the side of the tanks as they go by. Happy guys, right? They didn't know a few weeks later, they're gonna, there's the, uh, there's the, uh, Waterproofing uh, equipment on the side of the vehicles. So here we are, you know, happy soldiers washing their faces um, in the camp, having a cup of a mug up. Typical uh, sort of uh, bivouac scenes, right? Not sure what guy's, this guy's eating, but it was obviously very hot, right? <laughs> and he liked it. Right? Uh, sitting around the table, that's my dad right there. So that's the regimental headquarters tank. Uh, they're on parade. Uh, nicely shot stuff, right? And then uh, what surprised me is that we were having trouble looking at this film because it had double sprockets, sprockets on each side. We finally found a projector we could play it on. And Dad never actually saw this film. And the reason, he, without the double sprocket, it kept slipping all the time. That's Johnny Andrews, the CEO of uh, the Calgary's, who was killed at Dieppe. Um, my father uh, thought he was the one, and that switches to color. I had never seen color film of the regiment in England in World War II. So there's the uh, commanding officer of the, uh, the division. There's McNaughton, uh, whose son Peter just recently passed away. It was a journalist, a former patrician. The band, uh, don't know who this band was. I've been trying to track that down, right? If anybody knows, I'd, I'd uh, really appreciate you telling me who who you think they might be. Obviously second div, and it could have been there were several Highland units, it could have been one of them, but maybe somebody recognizes the kilts or the uniform. So that's a, and that's pretty good for armored to be able to march like that. They, you know. they wore their berets in the most haphazard manner imaginable. Right? Dad's was was amongst the worst. I asked him why he didn't shrink the braid. He said if they if they wanted it to be shrunk, they would have provided it shrunk, right? <laughs> Just looked like a cow flap on his head. So uh, that's the uh, regiment, the band. A great shot of them uh, marching away. Uh, after the parade, you can see the Calgary Regiment flash, the blue flash. Everybody smoked in those days, right? So they're all standing around. There's Johnny Andrews getting up to speak to the troops. Nice establishing shot. My dad's in the middle of this picture right there. And then they're on parade, and the, the general does an inspection. And like many generals, he's got a freaking little dog right running around, annoying the soldiers, uh, urinating on soldiers' boots, and, uh, and annoying them beyond belief. Combat photographer uh, taking pictures. Um, shots of the officers uh, on parade. Inspection taking place, annoying little dog. Colonel Andrews, General McNaughton. 
Cam Roberts, the new commander, talk to the soldiers. It's my father standing in the room, right? It's my dad. I hadn't seen that picture. 30 years old, young, virile, and chewing sweet. That's John Foote. Anybody know anything about John Foote? Yeah, Victoria Cross, right? And one is BC. One of two that were one at the other. That's in there again, right? I thought it was interesting. Padre carrying a pistol. My kind of Padre. It's been pretty fascinating to see these pictures. There's some poor engineers. Not one of them would be alive uh, three weeks later. So that was uh, interesting stuff that uh, we found. Um, just get back in here. So who are the key players? We've seen the soldiers were ready to go. Who is pushing them to, to get into battle? Well, first our, our Prime Minister, William Lyon Mackenzie Kane, an eccentric to say the least. Uh, the guy who got uh, advice as to the strategic direction our country should take by going to seances, in which he communed with his mother, who was dead. His dog was dead. Um, I'm not sure that his advice is any worse than we get from <laughs> some prime ministers today. None would be mentioned. Um, the key player uh, for the United Kingdom was uh, Churchill. Churchill was, uh, was a, a believer in uh, what was called the Second Front to ease the pressure on the, the Russians and saw that the Canadians might be uh, useful soldiers to do the job. Uh, Montgomery was the field marshal in charge of the uh, operations uh, overall, and initially he thought it was a good idea. Initially, Montgomery thought, yep, yeah, it's probably a good thing. We've got experience, we've got well-trained troops, and we've got a plan that will work, and I'll explain what was there. It was the brainchild of this guy, Louis Mountbatten, uh, nephew to the Queen, uh, to Queen Victoria. Uh, uh, not much of a strategist, but a very populist kind of guy, very flamboyant, and because he was part of the royal family, they gave him a job as being in charge of the combined operations. And he wanted to make a name for himself in combined ops, so he had all the royal Marine commandos and all the special boat units uh, under his command. This is uh, John Roberts, who was the uh, uh, commanding officer of the 2nd Canadian Division. Uh, Roberts was a First World War vet, uh, clearly a man of courage. He won a military cross in the First World War. But he was in over his head. He was not a good administrator. And, uh, and he didn't stand up at a time when he should have stood up. And I'll, I'll tell you that uh, later on. And Roberts made a statement that, out of context, I'm sure he regrets. On the night before they went into Dieppe, on the 18th of August, 1942, on their final briefing, as they were getting ready to board the landing craft, Robert said as the officers were leaving the, uh, the barracks, uh, the briefing, don't worry, men, it'll be a piece of cake. Well, I'm sure those were words he came to regret the next day when he found out the full sense of what happened. And I don't say this to be critical of Roberts. He thought, given the information he had, that it was going to work. But let me suggest that they didn't do uh, due diligence, and I'll, I'll explain why. So what are the key elements to a raid? For, for a raid for a commando operation, for a special forces operation, to, success, you have to succeed, you have to have three things. You have to have stealth. Nobody knows you're coming. You have to have surprise. You've got to hit them when they don't think you're there. And you gotta have overwhelming violence. You gotta get in and you gotta you gotta kill, capture, destroy, whatever it is, with overwhelming superiority. If you don't have those three elements, I would suggest you're not gonna have the key elements to a raid. And I wanna suggest to you that on the 19th of August, 1942, these were out the window, and I'm gonna show you why. Initially, the raid 
into occupied France was the military liked to give names to things: Jubilee and, and Overlord and uh, Gauntlet and and the initial raid to go into France uh, was called Operation Rudder, and it had some objectives. First of all, they wanted to uh, to breach Hitler's Atlantic Wall. You saw the Festum Europa, it was called, European uh, Fortress. So they wanted to breach the wall. They wanted to shake up the Germans. Secondly, they wanted to uh, seize and hold a port, a German position, a port and airfield for a brief period of time. Get in, unlike a commander raid, which was in, out fast, get in, hold, blow a whole bunch of stuff up, which soldiers love to do, right? Anybody here, ex-army? Yeah? What's the best part about being a soldier? Blowing things up, right? Totally the best. People tell you other things, it's blowing stuff up. And they wanted to destroy enemy port facilities and airfields. In addition, what's that? Anybody know? Yeah, yeah geez, what a great crowd. Everybody knows it. Yeah, they wanted to capture encoding equipment, um, the Enigma machine. They wanted to create by this uh, penetration of Europe uh, the need for the Germans to continue deploying a significant number of troops on the Western Front not to be able to send them off to fight against the Russians in the East. They wanted to test some new equipment and they wanted to, and this is probably as important as any single other one, bloody the Canadians. Canadians wanted to get into battle. The Canadian Army had a, a, a rebellion in England where they booed the Prime Minister because they were so angry with him for not getting them into action. The Americans had come into the war late. They were into North Africa. The Australians and New Zealanders had been fighting for two and a half years. Canada was still not committed. They were feeling out of the picture. Reconnaissance was really not well done. They interviewed people who had been on holidays to the UK. They did some aerial flyover. But a lot of what they took was from postcards. Isn't that a great way to do reconnaissance where you're going to do a raid in force? You, know, you put 5,000 men ashore and you, it's based on postcards. Well, it looks nice to me, right? You can land there and just get those citizens out of the way and, and we can uh, walk ashore and have an easy time. But listen, wouldn't that headland over here tell you something about landing on a flat beach? What would it tell you? What would you put in those headlands if you were the Germans? Weapons, absolutely. And they were honeycombed with machine guns, mortars, and 88 millimeters on, on fixed lines of fire so that even if it was foggy and smoky in the middle of the night, they had these fixed lines of fire, they knew exactly where they lay fire down on the beach in a, in a horrendous uh, cone of hail and death. They did a few flyovers, uh, but they didn't do any put men ashore. No human intelligence for the raid. All electronic intelligence, all old-fashioned uh, aerial photo, old-fashioned reading, uh, reading the postcards and interviewing people who've been to the end. What's it like? <clears throat> well, they wanted to get the, the men uh, toughened up. They took them to the Isle of Wight where they did their commando training um, to, to give them the specialized uh, training that they needed and to harden them, to fit, make them fit. So they all, uh, they all, all the uh, officers and men uh, of the second div uh, took the commando course, whether they were engineers or tank drivers or infantry, they were all commando qualified. And uh, that's the Fairburn fighting knife uh, down there on the right hand side as you look at it. I, that was the one my father was presented when he graduated from uh, commando school and uh, we still have it in our family. Rudder was uh, designed to uh, test uh, loading uh, the landing craft, putting on uh, uh, infantry, putting on tanks, putting on arm, uh, putting on uh, scout cars, putting on engineers. Uh, calm seas, a beautiful sandy beach. Um, in fact, I have a, I was given a letter today from a Fusier de Montreal, an FMR, who, uh, who landed with the FMR and uh, I just want to tell you what he said about the, about, uh, the beaches. 
when they did their training in uh, Yeah, he said the beaches were sandy, calm, and wide open, easy to run through. When we got to Dieppe, there were these pebbles, church it's called on the beaches, about this big to that big. And they all got tangled up in the tracks of the tanks and, and broke the bogey wheels and caused the tracks to spread off and the tanks were immobilized. So here's the, uh, here's rudder, here's the, now, the engine, here's how simple the DAS was going to be. The engineers would land, they would bring these great big logs up, place them all against the seawall, and the tanks would drive up over top of them, right? Well, in a training exercise, probably pretty reasonable. But what happens if you've got all of that firepower coming at you? First of all, those are very heavy. The engineers got to carry them, manhandle them to, into the position. And then the tanks drive up over the top. What happens when the tank is up here like this? Its underbelly is exposed and there's hardly any armor there. So you're vulnerizing, vulnerizing yourself even more. Right, but that was one of the, and this is actually General Roberts standing there looking at it and being quite too pleased with the way things would go. How would, they, how would the tanks and jeeps get ashore? Well, you see the beach is nice and sandy there, but they knew that the beach was not as as a level, so they say, what we'll do is we'll lay some matting down and then the tanks and the vehicles can drive over the mats, right? So we'll land, the engineers will then go ashore, and they will roll these mats out and, uh, and vehicles will drive on them. The Jeep, same thing. Here's this Jeep. I want you to notice the number, 8884. Uh, he's going to get up, this is a reconnaissance Jeep, uh, he's going to get up over the wall into town and, and assist the, the infantry and their reconnaissance and move them inland uh, quickly to uh, uh, disrupt the Germans. So notice again though, there's a special little bridge that's got to be put down. How's that going to be put into place? Manhandle, put down by sappers, by engineers. Yeah. Carry that off the landing craft, cross the shore, up onto the seawall, and then the vehicles will go up over top of it. They had some bulldozers to assist them as well. Notice that landing craft, TLC 121 in the background. That was actually renumbered and landed at DF, and I'll show you uh, what happened to it. The tanks were tested. Uh, you can see the ground is a very level. Uh, could they get through small barriers? Yeah, so it looked like they could break their way into town uh, quite easily. So here's how they were going to do it, right? Engineers would come out, lay the mats down, tanks would roll off, cross the mats, up over the seawall, all over those uh, bricks uh, and boards, and into town. Piece of cake. They knew there would be casualties, uh, so they, they practiced evacuation. Notice how close the landing craft can get to the shore. Right? They can get right to shore. So the, the soldiers uh, can pick up the wounded and move them right on off the beach, right onto the landing craft. Landing craft can just lower the ramp and they're right there. Well, at Dieppe, they couldn't get it back ashore because of the intense fire. So anybody who wanted, who was wounded and tried to evacuate either had to be able to swim or have somebody who could swim float him out to be evacuated. So they thought they'd, uh, they'd done a pretty good job. Uh, the infantry had, had trained hard. Uh, they did their rehearsals. They did them uh, uh, initially. The uh, first one was a little uh, confusing, but that's to be expected. The second one uh, went well, and they decided that the Canadians uh, would be ready, along with 50 U.S. Army Rangers who would be the first Americans to land in occupied Europe. They'd been in North Africa, but they had not yet uh, had any American troops committed, and this would be the first time. So, because it was now a combined operations, and, uh, and Mountbatten liked a, a flair for things, he decided to honor the 50 Americans, and the 5,000 Canadians, it would take place on July the 4th. What's the significance of July the 4th? Yeah, we all know, right? Independence Day, so there's gonna be a big hoo-ha, let's do it for the red, white, and blue, and, uh, and salute our brave American allies. Well, that's fine to pick the date. And they picked Dia, and they did all the reconnaissance, and they briefed the troops. And on the days leading up to July the 4th, from about the 20th of June through to the 3rd of July, the Canadians had the maps, they knew where they were going, 
they knew their objectives. Uh, there were there were five specific beaches that were going to be hit uh, along about a 20 mile stretch of the French uh, coastline. Uh, commandos on either side, and the, the the bulk of the troops, Canadians in the middle, along with uh, some uh, American uh, U.S. Army Rangers. So July the fourth is is the big date. They're going to go in, and this is Operation Rudder. But two things happen. Uh, the Germans spot them assembling at the Isle of Wight and uh, throw a few bombs at them and, and it's pretty obvious that the, the game is up and the weather turns sour so they, they cancel the raid, they cancel rudder. But here's what they do. You've got 5,000 soldiers who knew they were going to Dieppe, right? The raid is now canceled. You're going on leave. You've, had, you've earned some leave. You're 19 years old. You've been in training for two years. You can now go on leave in Southeast England. What are you going to talk about when you go into the bar? You're going to talk to girls. You're going to talk to friendly guys. And what are you going to tell them? Oh, man, we were supposed to go to Dieppe. Yeah, they canceled it, blah, blah, blah. Every, Southeast Germany, or England, was full of German spies. They had all these things, you know, about be smart, act dumb, who's talk to cost lives, close the duration, don't talk to them. Well, I was a 19-year-old soldier, and, believe it or not, and uh, I might have been just as guilty as them of having a conversation, trying to impress some young lady, but yeah, we were going to go kick some serious German butt, right? So. Germans know Canada, along with some allies, were going to raid Dieppe, but it's canceled. So you'd think if there was going to be another raid, you would pick another location. You would maybe even task another unit. But if these guys were ready, maybe you could use them, but send them someplace different. Well, Montgomery says it's off. That's it. We're not doing it. Uh, time is right, time is not right, we're not going to do it. Mountbatten, though, wants it to happen. He is anxious to so show the strength and value of, of combined ops. So he pushes hard to have the operation go ahead. Montgomery says, I'm out of the deal. I don't want to be in it anymore. And he moves on to do something else. And our prime minister intervenes and says, you've got to get it back on. Churchill agrees. The raid is back on. The raid is back on. The same place with the same troops declared to be back on. That's bad enough. But here's the changes that they made from Rudder to Jubilee. They cut out the airborne. In Rudder, there was going to be a British uh, uh, airborne regiment drop behind Sound Familiar behind the German defenses to cause harassment, confusion, and select some targets and meet up with the armor who had to punch in line to capture an airfield. So they were going to have paratroops uh, in the air uh, prior to the landing force uh, coming ashore. The, the uh, British government and Canada agreed, reduced the number, the uh, intensity of bombardment because they didn't want to cause injury unnecessarily to French civilians. And they were still using some very faulty equipment, including uh, tanks that required uh, uh, extensive maintenance and many weapons that didn't work properly, including the Sten gun. Who were they up against? Who was the enemy? Well, they were told it was a, it was a fourth rate uh, old guard division. Uh, in fact, it wasn't. It was a, a, a good solid, experienced uh, infantry of the line division, uh, almost at 80% strength, 302nd Infantry Division, and they had some very experienced troops. And they'd been there long enough to have really powerful defenses. Uh, they had uh, panzer tanks that they could call in reserve. They had well-trained uh, German infantry. They had uh, mortars like the one you see in, on the top left uh, in pre-positioned uh, firing. They had the 88, like you see in the bottom left, that was initially designed as an anti-aircraft gun, but was a very effective uh, tank killer. 
they had mobile uh, squads of uh, uh, Wehrmacht, German army, that they could move uh, very quickly into position with uh, light tanks and uh, lots of uh, rapid fire machine guns and pre-positioned posts uh, with uh, snipers who could uh, cause a deadly effect. So this is now called a Jubilee. And essentially what's going to happen is uh, this is the, uh, the beach itself. Uh, if you look uh, from your left to right, the number four commando, British, Cameron Highlanders of Canada going into Purville and, uh, and to the uh, outskirts of Dieppe. And then the South Saskatchewan, the Hamilton Light Infantry, the Essex, the FMR, Royal Marine Commando A, and my dad's regiment, the Calgary's, into Dieppe itself. Your Toronto Regiment, the uh, Royal Regiment of Canada, landing at the Pui, and number three commando uh, to take out the uh, take out the coastal batteries at Bernierville uh, on the uh, on the right of the map as you look at. Uh, you can see uh, what the objectives were. Uh, the, all the different beaches are, are outlined there. Uh, they thought they would penetrate uh, some uh, two to three kilometers inland, but the tanks would actually go almost four inland to the airfield and uh, destroy the airfield there and blow up a bunch of aircraft. Um, and the commandos uh, would, would seal the, the flanks and the infantry could go in, quote, unopposed uh, on the shores. So let's look at uh, Blue Beach. Uh, this is where uh, this is where the Royal Regiment in Canada, the young men from Toronto, uh, landed. Uh, they were reinforced by a company of Black Watch to augment uh, the soldiers, and we'll we'll talk about what happened to them. Uh, in the center, at uh, Red and White Beaches, uh, the largest uh, landing forces that went in there: the uh, Hamilton Light Infantry, the Royal Hamilton Light Infantry. Essex Scots from Ontario, the FMRs were supposed to be a floating reserve, but there was confusion and they were committed to battle. Uh, the Royal Marines also landed there, and my dad's regiment, uh, the Calgary's. And then on the, uh, the flank, uh, the, uh, the right of the map as you look at it, uh, Green Beach, which was the South Saskatchewan's, and the Camerons. So let's look at who did what. Royal Marines, uh, landed at Bernieville uh, on the 19th of August. And the Royal Marine uh, number four uh, on Orange Beach. Air Force, both the RCAF and the, R and the RAF uh, played an active role. There was massive air support and huge aerial battles. 74 squadrons involved in Diem. How many squadrons do we have in the Canadian Air Force today? Four, five maybe? They call them air divisions and stuff, right? Yeah, right. This is 74 squadrons of RCAF and RAF planes. Spitfires, Hurricanes, Mustangs, Boston Bombers. One of our, uh, one of our uh, RCMI members uh, flew at Dieppe, uh, as well as, uh, as Normandy. Navy had 240 ships to get the soldiers and their tanks ashore at Dieppe. Why is it doing that? There we go. This is uh, HMS Calp laying a smoke screen. Uh, the smoke was designed to uh, drift ashore and to make it difficult for the Germans to see where the troops were on the beach. What's the problem with smoke? It's also very difficult for the troops who are landing to see where they are, right? You know, the, the landing troops don't have goggles to see through the smoke. So while it does mask it for the enemy, it also makes it very difficult for the landing uh, aggressive troops to see. Here's the Essex uh, getting uh, onto their landing craft off of the major aircraft, or the major ship. Here's the thing about 60% of the landing craft that the Canadians landed on were made out of wood. They were wooden sided. Not much protection against a 7.62 machine gun bullet or a 40 millimeter or a 88 millimeter. This is the Camerons uh, moments before going into battle. You could read the tension 
on their faces. These are young men going into battle for the first time. And as Dad said, you couldn't hear anything in conversation with your, your colleagues because the noise of the engines of the landing craft was so loud that, that all you could hear was that roar. And you knew guys were talking to you, but you were actually in this strange little silent world of your own, listening to this babble of sound around you. And as they got closer, the noise got louder and louder and louder because they, they came under fire. Because as the, as the commandos uh, on the left uh, flank were going ashore, they ran into some German Navy and a big firefight developed and the Germans knew they were coming and they stood the 302nd Division up onto alert. So they were sitting in battle positions ready to go if and when the Allies landed. This is a, an amazing picture. This is a, a photograph taken inside a landing craft, one of the few that survived, of the Royal Regiment of Canada. They're just getting ready to drop the ramp. This would be the last moment that many of those young men were alive. This is literally combat photography, World War II. So they landed on the beaches uh, to uh, uh, a blaze of fire and lead and steel, uh, landed into hell. Um, the tanks uh, got tangled up on the beaches. Uh, of all the tanks, only a few got off the beach uh, onto shore. My dad was one of them. They, and he got up over the Esplanade and into town. But they couldn't actually get into town because of the, the tank barricades. So they had to pull back uh, off the Esplanade back onto the beach and provide covering fire for the infantry as they tried to evacuate from the beach. On Orange Beach, it was picture perfect. The Royal Marines, uh, by 7.30 in the morning, had the mission accomplished. They had done everything that they said they were going to do. They'd taken the guns out of action, and they withdrew to the beach and were ready to go. But they had to wait for five hours to get evacuated off the beach. And they took a tremendous casualties then, because there was no place to hide. Number three, Royal Marines on Yellow Beach, terrible. They're the guys that got in the firefight with the Germans. Only seven of the 23 commando landing craft got to shore. Three officers and 17 men were eventually all that was left. They sniped at the Germans for an hour and a half and then withdrew to the beach. And they had to wait another five or six hours to get off the beach. Royal Regiment of Canada, the Black Watch reinforcements arrived late. No smoke screen. Units were decimated. I'll show you what their casualties were. It was disastrous. Many of the soldiers never got off the landing craft. They were killed on the landing craft before they got ashore. Blown up on the landing craft before they got ashore. These are hard pictures to look at. But we need to see them because this is a sacrifice our young men made. These are German pictures taken inside of one of the Canadian landing craft. And you can see the horror and the carnage. Those men never stood a chance. They never set foot in France, except when they were buried. Red and white beaches, Essex and Cannon, the Hamilton Light Infantry, a lot of confusion when they landed. Uh, the, the radio communications broke down. German machine gun fire killed many, many before they even got off the landing craft. Whole platoons were, were slaughtered on the beaches. My dad's uh, regiment went ashore. They were late. Uh, he was in the same landing craft as uh, Colonel Andrews. Colonel Andrews' tank, the uh, ramp dropped, the tank went uh, off the landing craft and sunk uh, into water over the turret, but advanced forward. Dad advanced with his tank, which was waterproof, went around to the right and came ashore. Never found the Colonel's body. Don't know what happened to him. Just know he was killed at Dieppe. So, because that was battle agent, battle adjutant, he momentarily took over as a, as a battle commander and actually uh, managed the tactics and strategy for the Calgary's for most of the battle. Uh, as they say, they got up over the Esplanade into town, but they had to come back because uh, there was no infantry. Uh, they, and tanks alone are just a, a, a target for any tank weapons. You need infantry to protect you just like the infantry need you to protect them to take out machine gun boxes and, and uh, other tanks. 
So they uh, they went back to the to the beach to provide covering fire. Calgary uh, didn't have many casualties because they're inside of a big steel box, but they had uh, of all the Calgarys that landed, uh, some 200 plus, uh, only one guy got back off the beach. He swam back. Uh, there's the tanks. Uh, you'll notice all the tanks have got names on them. Uh, all the B squadron had B names, B for you, Bob and Bill, A squadron, A names, and so on. The regimental headquarters were all R. FMR should have not been uh, committed. Uh, the, the commanding uh, general uh, misunderstood some communication and he thought that an area was secured, so he committed the floating reserve and uh, they went ashore. Uh, Colonel Minar, the CO, was wounded five times, wound up as a prisoner of war with my dad. Uh, they lost 450 million men that day, killed, wounded, or prisoner of war. Only 125 got off the beach. Just to help put that into context, in our 12 years in Afghanistan, we had 158 men and women die. In Canada, it was uh, saddened by the death of those young men and women. But imagine, in a single day, from one small French-Canadian regiment, 500 in a day, one day, in a country of 8 million. Germans did some uh, paintings and propaganda pieces because uh, it was an uh, effective way to say uh, how invulnerable they were and how pathetic the Allies were. Uh, this is at Red Beach, one of the tanks that got into town. It uh, would have been from B Squadron. We saw, we saw uh, it in training, actually. It went by when we were looking at the training films. Uh, Bert was there. Um, I went to Dieppe, to the museum that's run by uh, French citizens of the town of Dieppe, and they can tell you who every trooper was in every tank that landed on Dieppe, where they were positioned, how far they got into town, did they get off the beach, did they get back into the beach, who was the sergeant or officer in charge of the tank, who was the gunner, who was the driver, who was the loader. When they found out that, that I was his son, uh, my father was Captain Stanton, I was like a hero, right? Because they were like, this is uh, the son, of the Captain Stanton, you know? <laughs> I'm like, yeah, my dad's good. Uh, there's the tanks on the beach, you can see they're, they're completely disabled, the tracks are off on one side. Um, but you'll notice a very few tanks on fire, uh, out of action. This is the landing craft I talked about earlier, LC-121. It was uh, Marcel Lambert, who was a, a, a squadron a troop leader with the Calgary's, uh, landed this renamed number, uh, number five, and that's his, that was his ninth troop uh, B squadron uh, tank. A landing craft, and you can see it was blown out of action. Marcel's uh, tank got off the landing craft, but never got off the beach, like so many. Here's that Jeep we saw, remember, on the Isle of Wight, uh, going up over the ramp? So good idea, right? Just uh, throw these uh, ramps down and steer into town. Well, look what happened in the real world. They got the matting down, and the poor buggers never got off the beach. That's my dad's tank, called Ringer. It was his command tank. Uh, you can see the, uh, the, the, t the track is gone. Um, he actually uh, left this tank for a while because it was on the beach, ran by the second tank, got into town, got up over the esplanade, realized it was hopeless, drove it back, turned the tank over to a sergeant, went back to his command tank and said, said uh, our war's over, he said. Uh, Dad said he was crew. Uh, that none of them were getting hurt, the 88 shells were bouncing off our armor, and I did not want to make a run for it because people were dying like flies on the beach. We fired up the Primus stove, had some pork and beans and bread, and waited for Jerry to come and take us prisoners. Our war was over. Two and a half years of training, seven years as a cavalryman, three years as an Army Corps officer, and his war's over in eight hours. One short work a day. That's what happened to those men who left their tanks. Dad's decision, staying in a tank was a good one. Because the officers that left got killed. It was a killing field. There's no doubt about it. You can see that the tanks got over the Esplanade and near town, and they did some damage. That uh, building in the, the middle foreground with the twin turrets was actually a, a German uh, communications unit. And uh, Dad's tanks and two others fired a bunch of uh, shells in. It would have knocked out some of the radio communication. 
which slowed down the, the uh, armor, the German armor reinforcements in coming. And for that, Dad and his uh, colleagues got a uh, mention in dispatch. It's the morning after uh, the desolation on the beach. Uh, this is an interesting photograph. This picture is of the first American killed in, in uh, occupied uh, France, a uh, uh, ranger lieutenant. Uh, he was killed and was lying beside a Canadian army captain who was very bad, was dead, but had been very badly uh, hit by a shell and most of his face was indistinguishable. But he had Canadian army uh, sh shoulder flashes. He was beside a tank. And my father was initially reported missing in action. And, and initially, the first reports were that that was my father, that he wasn't just missing in action, he was dead. Mom got a telegram from uh, the army saying missing in action and missing presumed uh, 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 dead. And then letters from the chaplain saying how brave he was and so on. Um, on uh, the days following uh, Dieppe. In November of uh, uh, 1942, she got a letter from dad. <laughs> he didn't know he was dead. So. And said, uh, things are good, boys are fine. Looks like we're gonna be here for a while. Uh, send some uh, civilian clothes and some smokes, because they all smoked in those days, right? So they wanted some uh, cigarettes. But initially, Mom thought she was a widow. Um, you can see the, the carnage of the boat. The Germans uh, picking up the wounded. That's your Royal Regiment of Canada at Blue Beach. Uh, suffered terrible casualties. Prisoners of war being rounded up. They separated the officers. Uh, two officers, one of Victoria Cross, uh, John Fulton Padre, and the commanding officer of the South Saskatchewan Cease Merritt. Merritt, uh, I've crossed Merritt Bridge at, uh, at Port Vale, and it's, it's only about the length of this room. And it's, uh, it's pretty amazing, right? And it's totally open. And he ran back and forth that with his uh, Bren guns and rifles and ammunition to, and said to soldiers, come on, get over here. we got a job to do. Let's get her done. The man was impenetrable. Uh, yeah. In that poster in the middle, the, the Allies developed a, a series called Men of Valor, and he was, he was the only Canadian recognized in the poster. Camerons, because uh, they were in wood-sided uh, vehicles, many were killed at sea. Uh, they were piped ashore by their uh, pipe major. Uh, they made the biggest penetration in land. What they showed was that well-trained, well-led soldiers could accomplish their mission if they can get off the beach. They are living proof that the second division was trained. Given an opportunity to get off the beach, they did a magnificent job. And the regiment received 25 decorations for bravery. You can see the damage that the 88 shells did to the tank landing craft and the infantry landing craft and the various others. Right? Uh, the AD is still used. It's a very potent weapon. <clears throat> Prisoners of war uh, surrendered. As soon as they were, uh, the war was over, they split them into two groups. Officers, one side, enlisted uh, personnel on the other. Officers off to one prison or a war camp, uh, enlisted personnel to another. Under the Geneva Convention, uh, officers are not required to work. Uh, enlisted personnel are. They can be put to work in farms and railways and factories. So they. The experiences as prisoners of war or officers and non-commissioned officers is very different. And uh, Dad's experiences were as an officer. It's the Germans uh, overseeing the, the battle, uh, uh, beaches itself, uh, color painting that the Germans again propaganda piece. Here's our POWs uh, waiting to be uh, put on a train and moved off to a prisoner war camp. It's a great story. My dad says uh, when the battle was over, he helped uh, sort casualties. And they were loading the wounded onto German field ambulances, and they were being taken off to hospital. And he said, I saw this big German standing there drinking a beer. And he said it was a hot, hot day in August of 1942. And he said, I looked at the German, and he said, and Fritz said to me, would you like a beer? In perfect English, Dad said, yeah. And the guy says, I worked in Sudbury for four years in the mines. <laughs> and he said, in fact, 
He said, you're a pretty big guy. Looks like you can use one beer for each hand. So he gave Dad two beer. Dad said, how futile is war? 20 minutes ago, me and Fritz are trying to kill each other. And now we're standing <clears throat> drinking beer. What the hell is this all about, right? And off they went to POW camp. So that's the, uh, near the brickyard in Dieppe where uh, the sorting of the officers and NCOs took place. This is uh, some of the wounded being brought ashore, uh, being marched through the streets of Dieppe. I've been to that exact location uh, in Dieppe. You can still see the buildings and, and, and hear the ghosts. When you're there. Do they have more than eight postcards yet? <laughs> Good point. Uh, commandos uh, came back. They were pretty happy. They'd done their job. Uh, our wounded were, uh, were brought back. Uh, luckily, <coughs> some did get off the beaches. The Germans uh, developed a propaganda poster uh, that showed how the Canadian Expeditionary Force had been smashed on the beaches. And uh, they took pictures of the busted up tanks and the prisoners of war including this Canadian Army, and what it says, uh, this is what it says in, uh, in German, a captured Canadian of the Expeditionary Corps, here too England used the often tried tactic of sending colonials into the fire for its own gain, right? So that's what all that says. That's my father. Uh, all the prisoners of war, he winds up getting his picture taken. Right? And uh, the thing I like about it is uh, he's got that cocky look, and he still, under his lip, got his snooze to murder him. He was a snooze, because you couldn't smoke a cigarette in a tank, you blow yourself up, right? So they chewed tobacco and swallowed that horrible stuff. Uh, Dad talked about triaging the wounded. Again, this is one of the propaganda pictures. There's the Germans in their steel helmets, the Canadians uh, in their flat helmet, uh, loading the wounded onto uh, those nine-person uh, German ambulances. And that's uh, my father assisting and That's just. Moments before he had the, yeah, before he had the conversation with the German who gave him the beer. Interesting turn of events. Uh, many of the tanks were uh, were rebuilt. Uh, some were not badly damaged. Others uh, just had the tracks blown off them, so they uh, retracked them and uh, integrated the Churchills into the German army. And uh, Speer, who was uh, one of the senior German, German leaders, was delighted to have these gifts. This is a picture of Dad at, uh, at Eichstadt 7B. And he said that the German photographer said, look directly at the camera and do not smile. So Dad said, uh, I decided to smirk instead. Right? And uh, that was his uh, official prisoner war picture. This was the first letter uh, Mother got uh, announcing that Dad was alive. Uh, First thing you'll notice is the postage stamp. It's Hitler, right? Because it's occupied uh, Europe. That great big long uh, phrase about Kriegel Fangen Post <coughs> means a prisoner of war mail. <coughs> you can see that it's a Mitloff post, so one air to North America, examined by sensor, and then it's got the Oflog 7B down on the bottom, and it's got mom's address. In Edmonton, where we were living at the time. The interesting thing is, is that, that uh, Dad numbered his letters. And mother was able to send him Red Cross parcels. And all of his letters, the two got through, and all the parcels but one got through from Edmonton to where he was in, uh, in Germany. Uh, Edmonton uh, Bulletin told a story the next day about uh, city officers. And initially, uh, Canadian Army propaganda tried to promote that it was a great raid, a great success. They were reluctant to acknowledge how horrific the battle had in fact been. Uh, here's just a quick idea of, of the strength uh, and, uh, and how many actually got uh, back of the Royal Regiment of Canada. 554 went ashore and 65 returned. The Rileys, uh, almost as bad, 582 and 217. The Essex, roughly the same size battalion, 52 back. The Camerons lost 76 killed. South Saskatchewan's 84. Black Watch only, only had uh, about 70, but they only had a reinforced company. The FMRs, who should not have been combined, 
584 ashore and 125 got off. The tanks are lucky uh, in that almost half got back and, and only uh, 13 were killed and four were wounded. Um, what did it cost? The Canadian Army had uh, 3,367 dead, wounded, or captured. The Brits lost nearly 300 commandos, the Americans only three. We had a destroyer, 33 landing craft uh, killed, 550 sailors died that day. 64 Spitfires, 24 Hurricanes, and so on. The biggest single air loss for the RCAF in World War II. Oh, so what were the lessons learned? What was learned at Dieppe? Well, you got to have Intense preliminary naval and artillery support. You need to deploy airborne troops behind enemy lines in advance of land operations. There was a need for a sustained element of surprise. You can't tell them you're coming and then not go and then come. They're going to know you're coming. You need proper intelligence. You can't just depend on postcard and letters from people. You got to where possible, avoid frontal attack on defended port cities. And you need proper reembarkation craft so that the wounded can get back off. Montgomery, so what did he say? He said, I believe we could have got the information and the experience at Dia without losing so many. Magnificent Canadian soldiers. This is from the guy who wanted to cancel the raid. Here's a little bit of irony. Uh, a number of the Churchill tanks from Canada were put into service by the German army and fought at the biggest tank battle in the history of the world, the Battle of Kursk against the Russians. And there's a, there's a Calgary tank in Waffen-SS uh, livery at the Battle of Kursk. Was it worth it? Well, my dad summed it up really well. He said, if blood and valor could have won the day on August the 19th, we would have punched through to Berlin. And I think the Camerons proved it, in that because they got off the beach and got inland, they showed what the Canadians were made of. So my dad's uh, medals uh, for the epi got, as I mentioned, an MID, I mentioned in this patch. Uh, they also gave them a special Dieppe Bar Combined Operations uh, Bar uh, that they can wear on their Canadian Volunteer Service Medal. There's the cost. There's uh, the Canadian graveyard at Dieppe. Canadians were buried initially by the Germans, so unlike, uh, uh, it's now a Commonwealth uh, grave uh, site, but unlike the other Commonwealth graves, which is head to foot, these soldiers there are buried head to head in the German style. Uh, it's the only uh, Commonwealth Grave Cemetery in, in the world where Canadians are buried uh, like that. It's incredibly well maintained. <clears throat> and it's not just maintained by Commonwealth Graves, the French citizens, uh, everybody in the town of Dieppe has adopted a gravestone or more than one gravestone. And they make sure uh, that they are kept like that year round. So Dad wanted to get home. He was determined uh, to get home fast. and. Uh, I got these stories from uh, Marcel Lambert, who was his friend. He said, uh, when we were liberated, we were separated by country, we were sitting in, in uh, France, and uh, he said, your dad and I were on the first plane load of Canadians to fly back to England. He said, we got on the plane, we're, we're sitting in the aircraft, and it's rumbling along, rumbling away, boom, blows the tire. And the pilot said, don't worry, we'll change the tire, we'll have you airborne in half an hour. Dad said to Marcel, no, we're not. He said, we're getting off this. We jumped off the plane, ran over, got into the second aircraft, flew to England. They landed in England. They're standing there having a smoke. And uh, aircraft number one that they were originally on comes in. Now the tire's been fixed, comes in, lands, crashes, kills everybody on board. Oh. Yeah. I wouldn't have had a brother. I wouldn't have had a sister. If Dad hadn't said, nope, we're not going on that one. Marcel said he was the luckiest guy in the world. He said the other thing he did, he said your dad should have won a Victoria Cross. He said we're being relocated from Eichstadt in southern Bavaria up to, uh, they were moving them uh, to the west because they wanted to surrender the prisoners of war. So Germans wanted to surrender the Allied POWs to Allied forces, not Russians. And they got to a rail yard 
and the Americans were looking for the Hungarians, because the Hungarians were still fighting on the German side. The Hungarians wore a khaki-colored uniform, like Canadians, not field gray like the Germans. And these American P-51 Mustangs come in, and they think they've seen the Hungarian division in this railhead, right? They come in to do a reconnaissance, plane flies over, one P-51 American flies over, and uh, takes a look, comes back, and then you can see the rest of them coming in. He said, your father, he said, I don't know where he got it from. He said he took a British flag, a Union Jack, out of his back, and he ran up and down the rail yard, holding up the British flag. And he said the American planes came in, did a wigwag, flew away. He said he saved hundreds of lives that day. But he said he couldn't get recommended for anything because it was nobody senior to him. And Dad never told me that story. Never found out until Marcel told me. By then, Dad passed away, and I couldn't confirm it. So anyway, Marcel and here in England, they're getting fattened up to come home because these guys lost a lot of weight. They go to a bar, and at the bar, there's some Canadian sailors. HMCS Huron says, "Who are you guys?" Well, we're here. He said, "We're taking a ship back to Halifax tomorrow." <laughs> Dad said, "We're on it." <laughs> Marcel says, well, "Well, no, we're not supposed to be. We're, they're." They're taking us back in the Carpathia in, in the month. That's an old dog. He said, we'll get old by then. So they pack up their kit, go down to wherever the HMCS Huron is, and six days later, they're in Halifax. Yeah. And seven days later, Dad was home. This is a picture of the Edmonton Bulletin. Uh, 1112 days after the raid, he came home to his wife, my, my mother, and me. That's little Jimmy's dad. And uh, I remember when Dad came home. See, my images of him were an 8 by 10 black and white photograph, right? That's all I, I knew of my dad. I was two when he left. And uh, they, he arrived at the train station in Calgary. There were three guys who got off the train at the same time, all big guys. And Mom said, there's your dad. Go meet him. So I'm running. I go. And I get halfway down the track, and I go, I have no idea which one of these guys it is. Right? So mother's friend says, you know who it is. So mom goes and gives dad a big hug. So then I know which one is my dad, right? And I can remember him hugging his leg, right? And I thought, ooh, this guy's big. Right? And I can remember thinking, this is not good news. My life is going to change. Because right? I've been this spoiled little brat with all these women who adored me. And now this big, hairy guy is coming into my life, right? Well, it turned out we became great friends, my father, my father and I. But I can still remember that first day thinking, this is not good news. <laughs> and at one stage of the game, my last story, my, my dad, of course, wanted to establish his presence, and, and he took over disciplining me. And I'd never really been disciplined. I'd been spoiled. So he sent me to every room one time, and then he came out. Allowed me to come on. He said, You got anything to say? I said, Yes. I'm six, right? He said, Yes. He said, What is it? I said, oh, I hate you. And he said, Really? I said, Yeah. I said, I said, I wish Hitler won. Because <laughs> it was all about me, right? And then Dad laughed and he said, Oh, we got some serious work to do, Jimmy. <laughs> so, yeah. So uh, that's it. That's uh, you've got a fresh view. Uh, yeah. 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 Some images that you never saw. I'm, I'm open to questions. I know uh, many of you would be, uh, you know, experts on the app. So if you have any questions, please feel free. Yes, sir. I've heard it said that when Mountbatten was assassinated on his yacht by the IRA, there were more than that's absolutely true. I can tell you that my father, who was Irish, uh, felt that it was poetic justice that he would uh, go out that way. Yep. Yep. I'm not about yes, sir. Only two brigades of the Canadian division landed on the day. Uh, was there any thought? And there was. Sorry, thanks, Thomas. Um, and they went against one uh, dug-in German brigade with artillery, etc., etc. All the preparations. Right. Why did the planners not 
you know, norm, at least go for the three to one standard attacking ratio. Yeah. Why why couldn't they get more people in there, other than the problems obviously with the beaches and stuff? Yeah. That, that, it's an excellent question. And, and initially, uh, it was believed that the use of that airborne behind the lines, the heavy bombardment by uh, naval artillery, and the element of surprise landing in the middle of the night uh, before first light would equal off and achieve the balance that they needed to punch through. Uh, when it became evident that, that that plan had changed, why they continued to go, and, and when you read the, the diaries of the individual soldiers, they knew, as this young FMR, I just got the material on said, we knew we were going like lambs to the slaughter, but we went anyway because that was our job. Uh, why the general commanding the Canadian Army didn't stand up to Mountbatten and say, we're not going unless it's three to one, is a question that only he knows. And I, I don't have the answer, and I wish I did. Yeah, yes, sir. The main problem seems to have been apart from getting up the slope of the beach with the pebbles with the tank, right. particularly. Uh, and it was hard, but I've been there, and I'm low tide, and it's a scramble to get up there. Yes. Was the armament along the cliffside that had been up and looked down the other yeah. way. That seems to have been the main part. I understand, and I'm a Navy guy, not an Army at all, that that's a G1 responsibility, the intelligence right. of what you're going to be facing. Was Churchman the, uh, yes. the intelligence yeah. major of that state? They misread it. How totally. come they didn't do more about that? That seemed to be pretty damn obvious when you're standing yeah. there. Sure. That's why when you think of jump ahead a year and a half to <coughs> Normandy and the landings and the, the beaches uh, and, uh, and the cliffs that the U.S. Army uh, faced, that's why the Rangers went up there to take those out because they knew those had to be eliminated uh, for the, and even at that, the troops on Omaha took a tremendous pounding. But it would have been a, a bigger slaughter if the, if the Special Forces folks had not taken out the 88s and the machine guns. I mean, my dad talked to a, a German uh, officer who was in charge of, uh, at, at Pourville, and they, they burnt out the barrels on their, on their GPMGs. They burnt the barrels up there, replacing the barrels they were firing so fast. And he said, we really felt badly, but he said, you know what? It's our job. And he said, those poor guys, he said they never stood a chance. But he said, their job was to try to kill us, our job was to kill them. And but you're right, church man failed. Definitely. Yes, sir. Was anybody cashiered for us? Our, General Roberts was, uh, was given uh, a, a lateral arabesque, you know. He was uh, moved uh, from command and uh, put into a staff position and sent back to Canada, right? Um, and I think that was appropriate. He, he failed in his job as the divisional commander. He should have stood up and said, as you point out, we don't have this is not the right way to go. Three to one is, is standard. I mean, if we've got surprise, if I've got the airboard, if I've got all those elements in my hands, yeah, I think we stand a chance. We can get in, get out fast, uh, do some serious punching and leave. And the Cameron showed it when they got ashore, as did, as did men from the Essex and other regiments who, in small groups, fought valiantly in the town and inflicted significant casualties on the Germans and took many prisoners of war and did get them back. But in the balance, was it worth it for 5,000 soldiers to be taken out, to, taken out of the order of battle? Every one of those was a dad and a brother and a son, you know, terrible. Yeah. Yes, sir. There was a Canadian officer being interviewed by a, you know, being debriefed or whatever you want to call it. And the German said to him, this is too small to be an evasion. Yes. It's too big to be a raid. Yes. And if you, I don't know if you read O'Keefe's book. Yeah, I did. Uh, where you just identify this as a pinch rate yep. to get a four-wheeler Enigma machine. Right. And if, I, if I'm following him right, we were we were just the excuse yes. to go into Dieppe because they really wanted to get an Enigma machine. Yeah. And, 
And they knew in, uh, thanks, good question. We knew, they knew uh, in July that getting an, an Enigma machine was one of the objectives. Dad knew about that because as a battle agent, well, he was only a captain, he was in on the senior planning just by the nature of his responsibilities. He was like a deputy commanding officer rank, equivalent. So he knew in, in, the, in the prior to Rudder that they were going to go into town. And they had these uh, technicians who, uh, who knew what to do, and they had German-speaking guys. And they had a specialist that they were taking in. And, uh, yes, sir? Did they get the Enigma machine back uh, to, was your London? Wrong building. I don't know the answer to that. They didn't get anything. They, didn't get they, they, get they went to the wrong building. Yeah. They were told, in the confusion, they were told it was on the southwest corner, it was on the northeast, or the southwest, or the southwest and southeast. Anyway, they scampered up the stairs, got in there, and it was wrong building. So I don't know if they found anything in there that was useful for them or not, but they didn't get an Enigma machine. As far as the Enigma machine, the tragedy is six months later, they captured Germany. Uh, and they get all the gear up the German right. U-boat. Yeah. But they made sure that nobody knew it had been taken. That's right. They, that, they announced that the U-boat and the trawlers they captured them on, that they'd been sunk. Yeah. And the idea, was, I think it would have been a real mistake if they'd taken an Enigma machine from Diet, because then they would have changed. Would have been changed, yeah. yeah. yeah it's a, it was a tough call to make. Yes. It's quite conceivable that, I mean, given that there's so much discussion about information and misinformation and subterfuge and deception, the upgrade they had been a part of that it, you know you can you can possibly make the case and I've heard people make many cases about the end. one of them is that they were they they were meant not to find it by searching and not getting it that would imply that I mean they already had the Polish one at the time I think the Polish Enigma machine so they were sort of there already that, yeah, I, that, that they didn't get it so oh well they really wanted they missed it Well, if it was, they succeeded. Um, but I don't think they were smart enough to create that kind of grand deception. They weren't. Uh, I think that the, the decision making at that level, being pushed as hard as it was by Mountbatten, the Dieppe raid was going to happen. And it was going to happen the way he outlined it. They weren't smart enough to, to be doing that as a deliberate, let's plan this to fail. They really thought it was going to work. <coughs> bad planning. Good soldiers, you know, Napoleon said there are no such things as bad soldiers, only bad officers. And there's a clear example to me. Yes. Just as a human interest thing, we had a chap in the, in the Royal Regiment of Canada, Ben, who was a prisoner of war. And he said the only reason that he was a prisoner of war is because they were changing the machine gun belts when he uh, got out of the landing craft. Yeah. And uh, later on during the uh, his encampment there, he recalled one evening where uh, they got the Red Cross money together and pooled it so that they could get a keg of beer. And so uh, they, the part of the cost was to uh, have the armed guard come with you and then of course have all the drinks. And so Jim recalls the time coming back to camp Pulling the armed guard, holding his rifle with a keg, with a keg of beer. <laughs> Good story. Yeah. Thank you. That's great. Okay. Well, thank you very much for the for your time and for the questions. It was great to be here. Great presentation. On behalf of the Royal Canadian Military Institute, this is Kim Taylor Galway. Thank you for watching today's webcast. We hope you'll tune in to further casts and we invite you to join us for live presentations at our CMI.